So I was sitting in my office uh, earlier this week preparing this message, thinking about the vision for Pine Grove Church. This has kind of become a yearly tradition for us on the weekend that we have our congregational meeting. We talk about where we've been, where we are, and kind of where we're going as a church to kind of bring that reminder and bring it to the forefront as we, as we reflect on what God is doing in, in and around our world today. And I'm sitting there at my desk, and I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about our, our history and our past, and I realize that uh, that old part of the building, that's the part of the building with the, where the, uh, the, the front face has been removed to see the brick underneath. There's the cross in the front. That's where my office is, if you don't know. Uh, that foundation was laid in 1854. Pine Grove Church isn't exactly a new church. We have a pretty rich history. Uh, and, and Pine Grove Church was founded in 1854. Uh, this is the oldest uh, picture that I know that, that we have uh, from around 1890. Anyone remember 1890? I didn't think so. Uh, yeah, it's been a, a long, a here long before any of us, when there was still actually a, uh, a grove of pines next to the building. Uh, here's it a couple years later, uh, or more than a couple years later, in the 1900s. There's another picture where they kind of flipped it around. Those are the front windows now. Uh, of the church, and they put the, the pulpit uh, kind of where my office is now, which is kind of neat to think about as I prepare my messages. And, and this church formed uh, partly because of a disagreement over uh, public schools, as was the fashion of the day, uh, but uh, be, be came together as a community of faith to study God's Word together and to worship together as, as a local embodiment of the family of God. Uh, and, and Pine Grove continued that way, slowly growing and developing in that direction for years to come. Uh, beginning in the 19, late 1970s, when some uh, Mennonite denominations began to uh, drop some kind of key doctrinal distinctions, uh, Pine Grove and other churches uh, wanted to make sure that some of those things were maintained. Distinctions like the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, things like the saving power of the gospel, that that be emphasized. And evangelism, to share that gospel with those who do not know it. Uh, as some denominations, including uh, the General Conference, dropped some of those things from its doctrinal statement, like the inerrancy of Scripture, uh, Pine Grove Church and a number of other churches uh, formed something called AMEC, the Alliance of Mennonite Evangelical Congregations. Uh, uh, AMEC is a partnership of voluntary, voluntary associating congregations who are connecting through sound biblical doctrine and the common Anabaptist roots who support one another in God's work. And so in the early 2000s, AMEC was formed. Pine Grove is still part of that. I meet with some pastors. It's a great support network. Again, the, the, the Pine Grove Church is not part of a denomination. Uh, our church is, is locally uh, controlled by Jesus Christ through our elders. Uh, but it is, it is great to be part of this organization that affirms God's word, the inerrancy of Scripture, the saving power of the gospel. And as Pine Grove stayed firm in its doctrine, as it continued to welcome people be into its doors, to be a welcoming community, a community that wants to know one another and sees that as an essential part of the worshipful life of the church is knowing one another and supporting one another, serving one another, Pine Grove continued to grow, and it grew in an interesting way. No longer were just people with Mennonite and Anabaptist backgrounds coming to Pine Grove Church. Now people are coming to Pine Grove Church with all sorts of backgrounds. No background in the church. We have people from every mainline denomination here, but probably most denominations that have been around the United States. We have someone in Pine Grove Church right now that came from our background, that kind, you know, from that background, from all those different church backgrounds, because we decided to focus on what was essential for the church. And secondary and tertiary issues, it doesn't mean they're not important, but we are going to work through those and, and, and seek God's will and seek God's word together, unified, because we uh, believe in the truth of God's word and are, are, are going to stand firm in the essential doctrines of the faith. Well, as Pine Grove continued to grow, uh, it, we needed to steward that growth by creating some, some more space. So about 12 years ago, this other side of the building was created. We have some aerial shots thanks to, I think it was Chris Johnson who shot these a couple years ago for us. Uh, they had added the great room, our classrooms, and because we had this other side of the building now, and these classrooms especially for children, Pine Grove Preschool was started in, in, in for the past 10 years. I guess we're in our 11th year now. Pine Grove Preschool has had a, uh, an amazing role in reaching out to our community, supporting our community, and has an excellent reputation in our community uh, as, a, 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 as, a, as a church's preschool. 
that, that teaches the fundamentals of, of who God is to all the students, whether they come from a church background or not, and also prepares them uh, for, for school, uh, which is what preschool is supposed to be doing. So that changed the nature of the church somewhat. There's a, there a lot more Pine Grove could do then to bring one another together. Uh, the, the next kind of major thing that happened around here uh, happened about five years ago, or not quite five years ago, there was a pastoral transition. Our senior pastor, Jonathan Yoder, if you don't know him, right up there, uh, after 20 years of ministry, we did a transition uh, together, uh, and then I took over as senior pastor. He retired in January of 2020, just in time. I, I don't let him forget that one. He laughs at me. He just laughs. That's not fair. Uh, uh, but the next day, we rehired him as our minister of visitation, and he continues to serve. And, uh, you know, we actually, I was just talking to him this week, and it's like, man, we need to get you back up here preaching again. It's been a while, uh, and have a close connection. By the way, in the middle there is Earl Osborne. Uh, he was the interim pastor here at Pine Grove Church several times, a professor at LBC, partly why doctrine is, uh, has been taught well here over the decades uh, at Pine Grove Church. Kind of three generations of pastors here. I love this picture, which is always kind of readily available to remind me of even, even, the, even the last couple generations' legacy here at Pine Grove Church. And so the question is, well, what is next? Uh, this is where we've come from. This is how God has been working in our hearts uh, to keep us firm in his word uh, in a congregation that likes to know one another, likes to have deep community uh, as we worship the Lord together. What is next for us? That is what we want to talk about today. We want to articulate the vision of Pine Grove Church that God has placed in the hearts of our elders and so many of our people as we have been kind of prayerfully uh, asking him that over the last five years. So this is what we want to do. I want us to, to first just take a moment and dive into Ezekiel 37 so we can understand what God is doing, what his kind of grand plan uh, is right now in the world all around us. Uh, then we can talk about uh, how that informs the way we approach the things we do here at Pine Grove Church, and then some things that are happening in the future to help accomplish that mission and vision that God has placed on our hearts. So Ezekiel uh, 37 is where we're going to be. Let me just kind of catch you up on what's been happening in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel is a prophet. It happens around 600 years after the book of Judges that we were just in, uh, kind of at the end of the times of the kings. And God calls Ezekiel to be his prophet and to uh, prophesy against the people of Israel because uh, they uh, had been become involved once again in idolatry. Uh, the northern and southern kingdoms at this point were split. Uh, Israel was not in great shape. And so uh, God called Ezekiel to go tell the people, hey, listen, they need to stop going after these idols. If you don't like my preaching, I suggest you read Ezekiel's chapter, or Ezekiel chapter 3 through 10. He has some very novel teaching methods. That's your homework this week. And see if we could introduce any of those here. A couple of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but by chapter 11, God gives Ezekiel uh, this vision of the glory of God, the presence of God leaving his temple. It's a horrific image that Ezekiel sees, that God is leaving his temple as he has this vision of, of the Israelites worshiping uh, various uh, idols in and around the temple. Uh, and, and even though this is a very dark and, and disturbing prophecy and vision that God gives Ezekiel, also there's a paragraph right at the end of chapter 11 with some hope that God says he's going to give a new heart to his people so that they might be able to follow him. Uh, well, in the following chapters, in chapters 12 through 24, uh, there's some judgments that are pronounced of, uh, on Israel because it has fallen away from God's ways again and again and again. Uh, and then some judgments on the nations for their idolatry and their ignoring of who God is and his ways. And in chapter 33, there's an acknowledgement that uh, Jerusalem has been conquered and destroyed. The temple has been destroyed. And the last of the Israelites captured and most of them dispersed uh, throughout the empire. And it is a dark day for the Israelites. Which is why as we turn to the second, it's not quite half, but the second half of the book, Ezekiel's uh, messages turn from judgment and accusation to messages of hope. A hope for the future for the Israelites. A hope for the f uh, future of, of all humanity. And a hope for the future of creation itself. Kind of zooming out to the big picture 
of God's redemptive plan for all humanity and the world and the eventual creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And so that's kind of where we are in chapter 37. There's already been some encouraging things in, in, in the first a few chapters of this section here, like a, a new king like David that will come, a reminder of that, that God will give them a new heart and his spirit will be within them at one point. And we are going to pick it up in chapter 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. So God gives him this vision of this valley. Many think it's a valley where, where a big battle was fought, so it would be familiar to Ezekiel. And it talks and emphasizes the dryness of the bones. Um, in, in a sense, saying, look how dead uh, this valley is. Look how dead these bones are. That's kind of why that dryness is emphasized in the text there. And in verse 3 it says, And he said to me, Son of man, which just mainly means human, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh God, oh Lord God, you know. Which, by the way, is the right answer. Verse 4, Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So, Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and the skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. This kind of image of, of, of a body being reassembled. Imagine this vision that Ezekiel is having of this, of this valley coming back to life. But, but they're just bodies now. There's not life within them yet. And so it says in verse 9, Then he said to me, Prophesy to, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army, and the valley is back to life. And then God explains the imagery that he's showing Ezekiel, what, what this imagery is, is symbolic for. In verse 11, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. And indeed, we are cut off. Why would they say that? Well, the temple's been destroyed. God's glory and presence has left the temple. They have been scattered throughout the empire. Not only are they physically removed and physically in distress as they've been removed and scattered, but they are spiritually cut off and depressed. They can't worship God the way God had called them to and instructed them in the Old Testament. There, there was a spiritual death that happened within the Israelites already if it hadn't already happened because of all that idolatry. And that's what that, those bones were, were, that's what that image meant. Verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you up from the graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it, declares the Lord. And that's the end of Ezekiel's vision. That even though all these terrible things have happened, God's promises are still good. He will not abandon his people. He will not leave them scattered around. Uh, that one day he's going to draw them back together, that there's going to be life in them to get, again, and they're going to be reconnected in two ways. They're going to be reconnected spiritually, that they will one day again live and occupy the land that God has given them to live in, uh, I believe, for, for all eternity. Uh, and not only that, but he addresses their spiritual concern. That one day that the breath, the spirit of God will be live in them and bring them alive spiritually in, back in fellowship 
with their creator, Lord God of the universe. And so he wants Ezekiel, tell the people about this hope because this will happen. The imagery here is very reminiscent of the beginning of the scriptures. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the creation of humanity uh, talks about uh, 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 humans being formed in this way. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. How dry is dust? That's right. From the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And, and not only does it recall the, the, some of this, these passages from the past, but uh, even though this, this passage in Ezekiel 37 is a prophecy for the Israelites, uh, that very much it is, is typified in the way that God acts and part of his redemptive plan. This imagery that, that is presented here to Ezekiel is the imagery uh, that is often used of God's plan for all of humanity, which Ezekiel goes into later in the book. That this is God's desire for all who are cut off, who are lost, who are separated from him, that there might be a way for them to be reconnected to him. And we know this today, not as Israelites, although I don't know what your background or history might be, but most of us aren't. Most of us are what the Bible returns or refers to as Gentiles, the, the non-Israelites, the non-Jewish people. Uh, but that there is hope for us as well, that God has turned his attention uh, to us as well in sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and be raised from the dead. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 just really briefly, and, and it'll be on the screen too if you, if, you, if you can't find it quickly, because similar imagery is used here as well. Ephesians chapter 2 says this in verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. This idea of a spiritual death, a separation, a being cut off from God is what's being described here. But it says in verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might know the immeasurable riches of, of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus, that yes, we were dead and separated from God because of our sin. We were cut off, as it said in Ezekiel, but God has given us new life. That when we trust in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And instead of being dead and separated from God, we are now alive to God, being molded and shaped by his spirit. Because we have received the spirit as well, that the Holy Spirit dwells in those who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ. So, so all this to say, let's, let's sum this up, that we are living in a world where we have a God who desires for us to know him. And that his plan for humanity, just as it was his plan for Israel, is to breathe life into those who are dead. To reconnect with those who are fall off. To, to help them not only breathe eternally, but to change their lives today as the spirit works and moves in us. That we are living beings, not just because we are alive here today on earth, but we are living for eternity when we place our trust in Jesus Christ. And there's one more piece of this imagery that I haven't talked about yet. Back in Ezekiel, chapter 37. When God brings Ezekiel to this valley, does he just suddenly have the bones come together like, Hey, Ezekiel, look at this. It's not what he does. Instead, he says, Ezekiel... Go prophesy to these bones. Ezekiel, you take part in this as you speak my word to those who are dead and need the breath of life. God involves Ezekiel. Did God need Ezekiel's help to do this? No, he didn't need it. But he desired to use him, desired to work through him. And this is also very typical of the way God desires to work. He chooses to use us, very imperfect people, to share his word. Very imperfect people to do his work. We see that in places like, well, let's go back to Moses. Did God need Moses' help to part the Red Sea when Moses raised his arms to part the Red Sea? No, God didn't need Moses' help, but he included him. When we look in the New Testament, see all the miracles and the 
and in the spreading of the gospel and the impossible things that God did through the disciples like Paul and like Peter and like the disciples of the disciples as they continued to spread the gospel. Did God absolutely need their help to do those things? No, God could find a way, and he certainly does in certain times. We see he could operate without any human help or, or, or interaction whatsoever, but he chooses to use his people, calls his people into this work of, of, of preaching the word to one another, of speaking the word to another, speaking the words of life to one another that we might respond in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls to who this God is, the saving God, the God of life. Can you believe he invites us into that process with him? It's an amazing opportunity we have uh, to take part in God's plan of eternal life and changed lives today. And, it, and it's with all those ideas and pictures in Ezekiel that I want to turn our eyes back to now, Pine Grove Church. What are we doing here? What has God called us to as a people? He calls us to continue to that, to proclaim God's word, to proclaim who God is, to proclaim the hope that is in Jesus Christ, to proclaim the, the, the things of God to one another who believe, to encourage, and, and, and to work through that transformational process that is knowing Jesus Christ, and also to spread the gospel to those who don't know, to share that word with those who do not believe, with the hope that they will have the breath of life breathed into them, and the Spirit would come upon them, and they would believe, and we will see them in eternity and see their lives changed today. And so as a church, we want to orient ourselves around this truth of what God is doing around the world, bringing life and light to all that he touches, and as people come to believe in Jesus Christ. And we've done that through a couple ways here over the last couple years, uh, that, that we accomplish our mission and vision uh, by bringing our people together to encourage one another's faith and to share the gospel with those who have not heard. Just as a reminder, three years ago now, three or four years ago or now, kind of went through a process with the whole congregation, kind of uh, went through a number of meetings with the elders, church council, staff, praying about how do we articulate what the mission of Pine Grove Church is and our vision as well. And got a lot of feedback from you as a congregation uh, and, and actually, it was a really encouraging process. Uh, just a remarkable, remarkable amount of unity in the feedback we received just from the general congregation and the survey that we sent out. And so we developed this mission statement that our mission is to love God, love others, and to make authentic followers of Christ. And this comes from the great commandment to love God and love others, which we should be passionate for and doing, and to make authentic followers of Christ, to make disciples, to help people grow in their faith and to grow in our faith as well. We described a vision as well. You also have, if you look in your bulletins, a, uh, a list of core values, which explain why we do what we do. I'm not going to go over those today, but if you wanted to check those out as a reminder, I would invite you to do so. But we also had a vision too that we called Rooted to Grow, that as we become, we become more deeply rooted in Christ, we might grow in our faith and help others to do the same. We articulate it this way, to equip every person at Pine Grove Church to know how to become more like Jesus and help others do the same. And so the first step with that is to say, are we giving opportunities for our people to get together in such a way that this kind of activity will happen? Are we gathering our people so that they might know each other enough to have these spiritual congregate, uh, conversations so we could be a spiritual congregation uh, and continue to be growing and, and transforming in our faith? Because we believe that community or fellowship or whatever kind of word you want to used to describe that connectedness that we have as the church, we believe that is essential for spiritual growth. And so we made a couple changes to the way things were structured around here. Uh, for example, we continue to support and emphasize our community groups. That if there's nowhere that, if there's no place that you're really connected in where people really know you, if there's no place that you're connected and you're not looking through the word of God together, if there's no place where you're not praying for one another because you know one another and praying for our church, and praying for what God is doing around the world, community groups, well, that's, that, that's the spot we've designed for that. If you have nowhere else that you are connecting in that way. Right now, we have about a dozen groups, about 100 people in it, uh, probably uh, expanding that by a couple more groups in the fall. And from the feedback we've heard over the last years, if you get in a community group, you will find that connection there. Another thing we did is kind of reorganize some of our church boards, which sounds super exciting, doesn't it? 
but actually it's super helpful. So we reorganized our boards of ministries, for example. Uh, and now we have a men's ministry uh, leader and committee under that, a women's ministry leader and committee under that, uh, a senior adult ministry leader and a committee under that. Uh, we are continuing to grow and develop our young adult ministry. Uh, if you want to come to our congregational meeting, we'll explain how Skylar might be taking part more and more in that as we expand the youth ministry director uh, position. But that's given a lot of opportunities for people to know one another, to be with one another, to pour into one another's lives. It's hard to grow spiritually if you don't really know uh, anyone else to encourage them with God's word or to be praying for them or, or, or to be walking through life with them together. Um, and so that, that is why we've, we've, we've put all these ministries together. They have a purpose, not just to be hanging out or to be enjoying the time together, although I hope we do that too through all these opportunities. But the, the end goal is to know Christ become like him and help others do the same. Uh, we've expanded our family ministry team to help our, our families come alongside them and, and, and encourage them and equip them with what they need to help disciple their children and, and to support the parents and grandparents that have taken on that, that such an important role. That, that, that's the way we've reorganized things to help us spread the, spread the gospel internally, right? To speak the gospel into one another's lives, to speak God's words into one another's lives so that we might grow and develop as the people of God, transformed by his spirit. We've also kind of renewed our commitment to our evangelistic efforts, looking outside these walls to speak God's word to those who do not know. We continue our commitment, for example, to our missions board, which did not change, um, although we do uh, contribute 20% of our budget every year to missions outside of our immediate ministry area. So that'd be either other parts of, uh, you know, distance, the, the place that we're not touch touching even to the ends of the earth. And I've, I've seen this brought in a number of new mi uh, missionaries in which to participate in that work that is happening around the world. In addition, we don't want to forget uh, that we have a local responsibility, too, to share the gospel, don't we? To share with our neighbors, that, that we can only be focused on the ends of the earth. If we're only doing that and not doing the job here, we've got a real problem. And so we created the Board of Outreach, which has had uh, a number of events over the years. And, and actually, uh, in these next couple weeks, we're kind of partnering as a ministry team uh, with them, uh, with a, a sermon series, as well as an initiative by them to kind of build a culture of evangelism within uh, the people here at Pine Grove Church. And we'll talk more about that over the next couple of Weeks. And it's been fun hearing how these events have developed over time, that people are coming into contact and repeated contact with people that they normally wouldn't. I've, I've heard a couple stories now like, hey, I met them last time and I caught up with them and found out what, what was going on with them at the last event. Now I caught up with the, them again at, at this event. Wow, this is really working. I would have never talked to this person normally. I would, my life would have never bumped into them. And, and so we're building relationships uh, through those events that we might have the opportunity to share God's word with them. Here's just a reminder for all of us, because it seems like we've done a lot over the last couple years. Right? There's, there's been a lot going on. That, that the purpose of this is not for bigger, better, more nicer ministries. Uh, the purpose of this is not just to have lots of big events either. The purpose is to have actually smaller, deeper, more intimate connections with each other, and with the people that we meet outside of these walls. It doesn't mean we don't do any big events. We, certainly our outreach board, they need to be big. That's just how that kind of thing works. Uh, but, but make no mistake, the, the purpose of this is to, to bring us together in such a way that we might know one another, encourage one another with God's word, and grow in our faith and our likeness with Jesus Christ, to grow in our life devoted to God and reaching out to those who do not know him. So then the question is, well, what's next? How is Pine Grove continuing to grow into this? And there's, and there's a couple ways. Uh, one, there's one more uh, kind of major ministry piece that we still have to put in place, and then I think we're done. No more ministry pieces. Ministries will change over the years, but kind of no more big ministry pieces for us, I, I believe, after this. And that is uh, a care team that we would like to form. We've already started beginning to work on. We have a lot of need for care, spiritual care, physical care, a lot of needs. And we also have a lot of people, a lot of gifts and desires to care and serve one another. 
And so we want to put together a team to help coordinate some of that so we can connect the people who do have this heart for serving and caring for one another with all the need that we have out there for people who need that care and attention and service beyond what, you know, I would give or Pastor Jaden or Pastor Yoder would, uh, would give and, and connect our people together. That is the care team over the next year. We will be building that up that we might encourage one another to encourage one another. That, did that make any sense? I think so. Okay. That's the care team. The second thing we're working on is, is, is a potential building expansion. We've been working on researching what we need for, the year, for now and for the years to come. Uh, and we've put together a number of committees to bring a project to the congregation to vote on by this fall. They are tasked with, and we've shared this with you before, so this is a reminder for most of you, uh, for coming up with plans for an activity center uh, with, you know, some supporting other building improvements to kind of support that, you know, handicap accessible bathroom, bathroom some kind of lobby, just some of those kind of uh, supporting uh, elements there, um, as well as, as kind of like a bonus objective, if, if God leads us in this way, to also put a pavilion uh, at the top of the hill here, a three-season pavilion, uh, so we could do more and utilize more of the fields and, and the room that we have at the very top of our property. And again, the purpose of the activity center is not just to uh, steward the growth of people who have come here, although it is certainly that, um, but it is to make sure that we have a place for some of these activities that bring our people together. Because in so many instances, we just need a place for people to meet <laughs> together, whether it whether it's uh, some kind of sports activity or not. In fact, I think the majority of things that will happen in that building will not be uh, sports activity related, although we want to make sure we have those facilities uh, available as well. For example, we have our preschool down there at the other building, and, and we like to keep the preschool as kind of locked down as we can uh, just for security reasons for our preschoolers. I wish that wasn't the thing we had to worry about in our world today, but it's just a fact. We, we try to keep it pretty uh, locked down and closed off. Uh, over there. That makes it very hard for groups to meet here during the week. The activity center gives space for those, those kind of weekday activities. I just talked to the senior ministries uh, uh, committee the other week, and they're like, man, what, we could just imagine the things we could do if we could just use the building more and invite people out during the week uh, to, to be together. Um, so that is, that is one thing we're looking forward to the future. And this is not a project we'd be growing into, so to speak. This isn't like, oh, well, as we continue to grow, we need, like, no, we're there now. Like our youth group, if you combine the, the senior high and, and junior high, sometimes there's 60 plus students there. You try putting them in the great room to run a game. I need a new great room. <laughs> so we're kind of already in the spot of needing that kind of space to do these ministries. And of course, to continue to steward the growth that God has brought to us. And last, what are we working on in the future? Well, we, we want to develop a discipleship plan for the church. This is not another ministry or another program, but it is a means of being able to describe and equip one another with how to make a disciples as you are going. That means if you're meeting with the ladies' Bible study on Tuesday morning or going to some senior ministry event or serving in the tech team or serving in children's ministry, or going to one of the women's or men's ministry events, or whatever it might be, this is equipping us and, and focusing us in the way that Christ made disciples, that we might make disciples as well. And to kind of roll this out for everyone in every ministry, so that as you are going, we are speaking the words of life to one another, that we are helping one another grow and develop our faith in an intentional way, not just kind of accidentally as we go along and happen to do this, but to be intentional in all the ministry places that we are involved in here at Pine Grove Church, that we remember, hey, we're brought together because God wants to do something here. God wants to do something in my heart and in my mind. God wants to do something here in, in your hearts and your minds and grow you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We'd like a way to be able to talk about that as a congregation and be very intentional about it now that we have all these places that our people are coming together to the various ministries that have been formed here. So that is how we are trying to interact with God's grand plan to invite people into a new life in Jesus Christ and a life that lasts for eternity. And as we go forward in this, it's going to take intentionality by us to not get lost in, in some of the details, but to remember why we are brought here together. We're brought here together to worship and serve God. 
to become more like our Savior and help others do the same. And while Pine Grove has grown and developed over the years from its very beginnings because of its, its, its desire to be sound in doctrine and to be together, uh, that is the same way we will move forward in the future. Uh, we, are not, we have a foundation that we are built on. We don't need to change the foundation. We just need to continue to be doing the work that God has called us to as his people. This enormous opportunity to pour into one another's lives. We need to be people who are continually looking that, for that opportunity to welcome people into our lives as they welcome us into their lives. We need to make sure as we go about the various ministry things we are doing, we are not just getting caught up in the logistics of running our various events and ministries, but reminded, oh yeah, that is why God has us here together, that we might know him and, and grow in our devotion to him as his people, through the supernatural working of his spirit living within us. We need to continue to be a people who value knowing one another. And, and we have a meal this afternoon. I, I would recommend you go sit with someone that you, you don't know. I know I've had conversations with some of you like, oh, man, there's a lot of new people here. Well, get to know them. Invite them out, uh, out to lunch. Invite them to, to meet up during the week. Go meet a family at a, at a playground while the kids play, and, and you can talk to the parents. It, it is that togetherness that is, has made Pine Grove uh, the church that it is today, and it is the reason why it has continued to grow over the last, you know, 170-something years. Um, that reminder for all of us that God desires for us to be together and to know each other. And it is through that that he works in such powerful ways uh, among us. And so I hope today that you're reminded of, of what God is doing. He's a God who has called us to participate in this plan of sharing the words of life with one another so that those who know Jesus Christ are transformed into his image and those who do not know Jesus Christ hear his message of hope, that there is the hope of the forgiveness of sins because of Christ's death on the cross and eternal life because of his resurrection from the dead. Let's pray that God would do that in us and through us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would work in, in a mighty way in Pine Grove Church, Lord. Just as many of us came here, uh, because you helped connect us to someone that you would still make those connections happen. That we'd be, we would be a people that would not forget that ministry is, is interpersonal and about knowing one another as we seek to know you, God. I pray you would work by the power of your spirit in ways that go beyond our imagining as you work to grow and develop our minds and our hearts towards our Savior. Lord, show us the opportunities so we might each participate in the work of life that you are doing here among us. As we seek to know you, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.